Okay, so should I go ahead and start? Give us just one minute to get everything okay. totally set. Okay. We just wait also a couple of minutes for people to trickle in. Okay, yeah, so it looks like the live stream is a go and we'll probably start right around 11.01. Um, Ankita, I'm glad you could make it. I know you've had a crazy morning. No, no, it's fine. I, I might have to run maybe around like 12, 20 or something. <laughs> but okay. Before that, it's all fine. No, hopefully, hopefully won't we won't. Long. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you never know. Yeah, it depends on the question sometimes and yeah. It's up right. to you as well how long you would like to. Right. All right. Perfect. Um, by the way, do you do Daniel or Dan? Do you have a preference? The Dan is fine. Okay. I was I always have to ask because I always I, say that when I mean, you know, I do go by Jennifer, but I always feel like I'm in trouble when someone calls me Jennifer. I'm like getting scolded <laughs> by my mother. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. And, you know, as I was saying, we have always have lots of um, latecomers. Uh, so let's see. Good morning to everyone here. Thank you for being here. We are so happy to have Professor Daniel Hammer. Uh, so Dr. Hammer is a professor of bioengineering at the University of Pennsylvania. He was recently named the director of the Penn Center for Precision Engineering for Health. Uh, Dan was trained as a chemical engineer and has won many awards, including the Biomedical Engineering Society's Distinguished Lecturer and the NSF Pre Presidential Young Investigator Award. Uh, Dr. Hammer's lab develops synthetic tools to mimic biology, such as making artificial cells from synthetic tunable materials. And they also focus on the role of cell adhesion and motility in the immune response. So I imagine that's gonna be the topic of his talk today. And with that, um, Dan, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for being here. Thank, thank you very much for having me. You can hear me okay. Uh, let's make sure you can see my slides. Uh, go into presenter mode. That look okay? Yeah, all good. Oh, great. So thank you very, thank you very much uh, to both of you, to Jen and and Keita for um, for having me. And uh, you know, I would, I'm sure people have said this before, but thank you very much for running this uh, this seminar series throughout the pandemic. I think it's been a great way to build uh, community among the the cell migration uh, people, and uh, it's it's really exciting to participate. Uh, so it is indeed true. I'm going to talk about cell migration today. So uh, those of you who are interested in, in things like protocells and synthetic cells and synthetic organelles, you'll have to send me a message if you're interested in those kinds of things. But uh, today I'm going to talk about the work that we've been doing on amoeboid cell migration. And uh, the talk is broken up into two parts. First part, I'm going to do a summary of what we've found about the mechanobiology of uh, amoeboid cells. And then the second part, I'm gonna talk about uh, upstream migration, which is a, a very interesting phenomena that has all sorts of curious features to it and, um, and tell you a little bit about how we've tried to contribute to an understanding of that problem. Uh, I've listed uh, many of my collaborators here. I'll, I'll, I'll try to remember to mention them uh, as, as we go along. I just wanna point out that we've had a wonderful collaboration with Jan Burkhart's lab at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia over an extended period of time. And that's been central to the kinds of things that, that we've been doing. So uh, we all know that motility is important in the immune system. Most of the cells in the innate and adaptive immunity can, can display motility. Uh, an example of that are the dendritic cells, so dendritic cells, they patrol your skin, they pick up antigens uh, as uh, in monitoring the skin and perforations in the skin. They can pick up those antigens and then carry them to secondary lymphoid organs and then deliver them in person to uh, other cells in the immune system. And so 
for example, dendritic cells will pass on antigen or antigenic determinants to uh, uh, CD4 positive T cells in order to stimulate the adaptive immune response. And this interaction is key to things like building vaccines and uh, understanding immunity and, and how it works. And remember, all, all transfer of information in the immune system uh, occurs by hand-to-hand -hand, uh, passage, by the actual transmission of a molecular entity from one to the other. So it's key that cells can crawl around and find each other uh, for the functioning of, of, of immunity. So I wanna talk about different ways that we've been measuring forces of cell migration for these highly motile cells. I'm gonna start with the dendritic cells. And the method that we've used to uh, determine forces of migration with dendritic cells uh, are microcoast arrays. And this was done in collaboration with Chris uh, Chen. And the student in my lab who did this was uh, Brendan Ricard. So the idea behind these experiments is that you can take a polymeric array of microposts uh, of known, of, of known uh, elastic constant, and you can stamp them with a molecule like fibronectin. When you look at the deflection of the post, you can actually figure out the forces that the cells had to exert in order to deflect the post because you know the spring constant of the post. And uh, the populations of dendritic cells, they crawl around famously on the surface of these post arrays. They'll, they'll move from place to place and they'll, they'll migrate and they'll pull the posts as they're, uh, as they're moving along. So uh, what we have been, what we wanted to do in these experiments is try to understand the uh, forces that dendritic cells exert when they're moving uh, chemotactically toward a target. And of course, as many of you know, uh, cell, many of the cells, the immune system, dendritic cells, T cells, and so forth, they move directly throughout the immune system through chemokine gradients. So all of these cells possess chemokine receptors and, and the chemokines ligate those receptors differentially across the cell body. And then the cell can decide which direction it wants to go. So to study this in vitro, we adopted a, a, a flow chamber, a gradient chamber that is well known to many of you. Uh, it's a Christmas tree microfluidic chamber. There are more advanced versions of these uh, chambers that are now available for, for study, but we use we use this one. Uh, Richard came from uh, Walker in 2005, but this is a nice way to make a gradient across uh, uh, a cell length. Uh, the idea is that you add high, medium, and low concentrations of chemokine, they get split and mixed. Ultimately, they go into a channel and they make a continuous gradient. You can also do this experiment where you make counter gradients if you want. So if I want to explore, as I'll show you in a few slides, counter gradients and make cells decide between two chemo chemokine receptors and make decisions as to which way they want to go, I can, I can do that experimental test in a single chamber. So uh, if I just make a single gradient of a, of, a, of a chemokine and I watch what dendritic cells do, this is in the absence of any force measurement device for right now. Uh, these dendritic cells can move with great fidelity up the gradient. So here is an example of uh, dendritic cells move, moving up a gradient. Uh, and this is, this is in a gradient of CCL19 uh, and mature dendritic cells bear uh, CCR7, which is a chemokine receptor for this, for this uh, ligand. It's interesting that the way dendritic cells move, uh, it, it almost reminds me of a severed hand. I'm using my, my prop of my hand. That's a, so there, it's like a severed hand. So imagine like I cut my hand off at my wrist and, I, and my hand could have motion. It was like, like Fang in the Adams family. I'm, I'm dating myself by using this reference. But so imagine that your hand could move around and your, your fingers pull your palm as you're, you're going along. That's the way dendritic cells move. And uh, I... So here I look at the palm of the hand, it's bright, but you can see that the phillipods are hanging out in front of the cell. So the, the way I, uh, the, and I, I'm going to bring this up a bit later, I'm, I'm, I'm fishing for, for people who might know something about how this, how this works, but the, the phillipod, the direction of the phillipods or where they're placed on the cell body dictates the direction of motion. So the phillipods could be in any possible direction, but they are clustered toward the higher concentration of the chemokine. And the question is what inside of the dendr dendritic cell is controlling that positioning of, of the phillipod? So we could get wonderful chemotactic motion with dendritic cells uh, using uh, this, this methodology. So if we combine that gradient chamber with the post arrays, 
uh, we can make measurements of directed motion of dendritic cells uh, as they move up the gradient. And this is what Brendan did. So uh, these, so these are dendritic cells, the, the I should use by little laser pointer arrow. So the, the white arrow is indicating the direction of motion of the dendritic cell. And the, the color coding is indicating the force that we see on each post in units of nanonewtons. So this range is from zero to 0.8 nanonewtons. Just and, real quick, what's the ligand? What's the ECM? We, we used we used fibronectin for this uh, as well. We use fibronectin. So uh, in this in this particular experiment, you can see that there's a, a black line in across the dendritic cell body, and half the forces are in front of that line, and half the forces are behind that line. It gives us an index of where spatially the forces are clustered. Uh, by the way, all the forces are inward toward the cell. So the cell is grabbing out and reaching out to the filobods and pulling itself forward as, as it moves. But the key is that the black line is right at the front of the cell in all of these cases. So these dendritic cells are pulling, uh, all their forces are at the front or leading edge. They're touching the, the post arrays and then and pulling themselves forward. And uh, based on, there are a lot of variable measurements on the amount of force that you see from myosin motors. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the average force per filopod is about a half an atom. So there's a very small number of motors in each filopod that's driving, uh, driving this motion. So uh, now what about counter gradients? I, I, as, I, as I said, with these kinds of chambers, you can make counter gradients of chemokine and make dendritic cells decide which, which chemokine do you like better? And so, uh, so if I if I make a counter gradient of CCL19 and CCL21, cells will will uh, prefer CCL19. Um, if I make counter gradients of two different chemokines that bind to two different chemokine receptors that the dendritic cells have, CCL19 and CXCL12, uh, the cells will again prefer CCL19. But if I make uh, a counter gradients of CCL21 and C CXCL12, the cells don't prefer either gradient. They actually like both chemokines the same. And we find this a very interesting dynamic because uh, this is the, the plane of equi stimulation. It basically is telling us that there's a signal that being generated by both chemokine gradients that's exactly the same and the cells can't decide and they stay stuck in a, a certain spatial location. And you can see this if you do image analysis on these cells. So I think I have to change back to automatic to do this. So this is a counter gradient and the cells are coming from the top and coming from the bottom and positioning themselves on a line. We can also image this in image analysis space where we can actually track individual cells and watch as they accumulate on a central plane. And so it's pretty, uh, pretty convincing that the cells will be sequestered at this location. And uh, we've tried to analyze this, this uh, problem in a number of different ways. Uh, what we think is basically happening is that cells that are at the top of, of the field, they are overwhelmed by the concentration of CCL19. There's no differential occupancy of, their, of the appropriate receptor in a high concentration. So the only gradient they see is the distant gradient. So they'll move downward toward the other gradient. And correspondingly, uh, in, the, in the high C CXCL, 12 region of the gel, they'll be overwhelmed by the ligand there, but they'll see the distant CCL19 gradient until they get to the middle, middle plane and they actually cluster, cluster together there. And uh, we uh, actually wrote a model. This, this is actually the only place where I'll show a model. Some of you know that I got my start as a modeler, but this is the only place I'll show a model in, in, in this talk. So we had this idea that a simple way to figure out dendritic cell motion would be to figure out how the filopods were positioned and they would grab onto a site and they would exert a contractile force and pull the cell body forward. We use the well-known Chan and Odie uh, methodology for looking at forces exerted by a filopod on a surface, the standard adhesion clutch model that they've developed. And we modeled that for every filopod. And then we, we built a, a simple uh, uh, heuristic model where we correlated the gradients to the positioning of the filopods. And this is what I wanted to talk to everyone about. So if you have this simple rule where for certain gradients, the filopods will be positioned at the front of the cell, you can very easily get all the manifestations of collective cell motion that I talked before 
I showed you before, we, we've seen an experiment. So I can get a situation where one chemokine dominates over the other and all the cells move toward the higher concentration of that one chemokine or to the other chemokine. But here in uh, this panel B, I can simulate a situation where the dendritic cells move and they, they cluster together on a central plane and they stay in the equi-simulation equi plane. The key to making this uh, molecule, this uh, model better and more testable is to figure out what it is inside of the dendritic cell that's responsible for nucleating the phyllopods in a particular direction. So if any of you have insights into that, please inbox me or let me know, and I'd love to chat with you further in the future about that. Okay, so th that's what we've been able to do with dendritic cells. And I wanna compare that now to uh, work that we've done with neutrophils. So in this case, uh, the way we did our neutrophil attraction microscopy uh, is using a standard bead-based uh, 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 TFM in collaboration with a fellow that many of you know, Micah Dembo, who developed lots of the, the basic codes for analyzing uh, stresses in gels. And the basic idea behind this experiment is you take a field, uh, this is a, a polyacrylamide hydrogel, uh, you put beads inside of it, you put, uh, you functionalize the surface. In this case, the ligand is ICAM1, uh, you tether to the surface using protein A. Uh, the, the, the integrin uh, that's responsible for the migration is going to be the beta-2 integrin on the neutrophil surface. The gel elasticity is uh, 7 kilopascals. And in this very early experiment that we did, uh, uh, that was done by my student Lee Smith, uh, he used the pipette as a delivery mechanism for the chemokine f met -Lufi. And so the neutrophil, which is shown here in silhouette, uh, is going to move directly toward, toward the target. And the inset in the lower left shows us what the traction stresses for this neutrophil are like. And neutrophils, uh, they uh, have a very odd way of getting around. They exert contractile stresses in the uropod, in, in the rear, in order to move places. It's like when you grab your tube of toothpaste in the morning and you grab the end of it and the, you grab the, the, the uropod, you're grabbing the uropod of your toothpaste. You're going to think about every time you brush your teeth from now on, you're going to think about the uropod of a cell. So you grab the, you grab the uropod of the toothpaste and, and the fluid comes out the lamellopod of your toothpaste container. So, uh, so that's the way neutrophils move around. They have these, these rearward contractile stresses that, that push the cells from the back and then force the cell to move forward. And if you change the position of the pipette, uh, the cell will very quickly move toward the, toward the pipette. And, but the traction stresses still remain in the rear. So, uh, so oh, this, oh, this, this is Claire again. What is the ahead. direction of those forces? Is it inwards or backwards inward. or all, inward? All okay, inward so it is squeezing. Inward contractile squeezing at the back. I'll, I'll okay. show you uh, more detailed maps of that in, in a moment. So, um, and so of course, there's this interesting coupling between differential receptor occupancy uh, across the cell body and the rearward management of the contractile forces. Uh, there have been some models by, uh, by people like Jason Haw to try to understand the coupling between gradients and, and positioning of different, different motors and cells, but I, I don't think that this model has been uh, fully, fully justified yet. Anyway, uh, so, so we, through substantial improvements, both in our methodology for making gradients and the uh, resolution of doing traction microscopy, we were able to improve on, on these measurements. And the student who, in my lab who did this, uh, uh, her name was Rasad Janat. And so we went very high in bead density uh, in these gels. And this is a typical gel that uh, we would use. Uh, and, and then we can make a gradient of soluble factor and, and do this entire experiment in one of these Christmas tree mixing chambers, which I described before. And the, the canonical experiment, the one that uh, is most compelling is when we made this gradient. Uh, in this case, of course, the gradient is higher at the bottom than the top. And this is what the traction maps look like for the neutrophil. This is on a 12 kilopascal hydrogel in this case. And the, the units of, uh, of stress that are indicated here are in Pascal. So uh, these very bright regions in the back are about one kilopascal, 1 1.6 kilopascals is the stress. And you can see with this better spatial resolution of what the forces are, that the forces are actually punctate 
in the rear of the cell. That in this particular case, in a very strong gradient, the neutrophils are gonna move in the direction of the black arrow. And the four centers are pinned at the back, and there are two of them. And the arrows that indicate the direction of the contractile stresses are acting inward at the back. So these four centers are basically pinned at the back and like little actuators that are pushing the cell along as it, as, as it moves downward in this strong gradient. Now you could ask the question, what would happen if I didn't have a gradient? What, are, what if I had just had, if I were studying chemokinesis, uh, what would I see? So this is in chemokinesis. So this is a uniform field of chemotractin. There's no gradient of attractant in this case, just 10 nanomolar f metlu phi, right about at the KD of the receptor, again on a 12 kilopascal gel. And what you immediately see is that the four centers are less active. Uh, this is the same scale on this figure. Uh, so the four, there are four centers, but they, the, the stresses in them are not as great. They still act inward, but uh, they're, they're not as strong. So, and what is key though in chemokinesis is that the four centers are not pinned. They actually move around the periphery of the cell. So here we're at zero time. What we see is these two four centers, they're, they're kind of weak. They're pushing the cell that moves in a particular direction. But if the four centers change orientation around the outside of the cell, then the direction of the cell will change. And so because the four centers are not pinned, at, in the periphery, and they're dancing around the periphery, the direction of motion is changing. And that's, that's the basis of, of chemokinesis, that the four centers are not as strong. And so, I, and then I, we, could, we tested, we, we, we did test intermediate conditions. So, uh, so I just showed you the panels for chemokinesis, they're on the left. Uh, and I, I first showed you the panels for strong chemotaxis, they're on the right. And what we could do is do an intermediate experiment where we made a slightly weaker gradient, and that's shown in the middle. And if we have a weaker gradient, what happens is we do get some four centers, but we build in some element of asymmetry into the motion. So for example, here uh, in, in the center, uh, there's a strong four center and a weak four center, um, and they're both acting contractile inward, and they're forcing the cell to move forward. But because the four centers are a little bit more labile, and they change their position, the cell is a little bit more wobbly in its directionality. So there's a direct coupling between the directional motion, the chemotactic index, if you will, and the, the magnitude of the forces that we see. And we could put this all together into one, one diagram. So this is, uh, these are all the conditions that we tested here at the bottom. Uh, this is chemokinesis. And then these are three uh, examples of chemotaxis. Um, and so, uh, and then on the left, we're plotting the traction force, and the right, we're plotting the chemotactic index. So it'll take me a little while to go through this. So, so first in chemokinesis, there's no gradient. The, the root mean squared force in a neutrophil is about 50 nanonewtons in that case. In the highest bar that we have here, if we have a very strong gradient and the cells move directly toward the target, their chemotactic index is high, uh, quite high here, 0.7 or so. And the root mean square traction force that we see in that case is about twice, uh, about 100 nanonewtons or so. If we make the gradient weaker, either by decreasing the gradient, which is a step to the left, or by increasing the mean concentration across the cell length, if you increase the mean uh, concentration of chemokine across the cell, your differential occupancy goes down, not up. Um, both of those weaken the traction force and they weaken the chemotactic index. Um, and that leads to intermediate levels of the force and intermediate levels of the chemotactic index. So there's a direct coupling, again, between differential receptor occupancy and the magnitude of the forces that we see. Now, one other interesting th thing about this is what, what is in the back of the neutrophil that's causing this. And a great insight comes from the work that uh, the Bourne lab did at looking at row A sensors. Uh, that's clearly a known uh, a molecule that's in the back. And uh, we could demonstrate that by blocking rock, uh, which is downstream of row A, we could eliminate the uropodial force. And uh, so in this experiment, you can see that if we use, in the strongest gradient on the best material that we have, we use an inhibitor of rock, we wreck the uropodial force centers and we get no significant directional motion. Now, I know there's a, a community of people who 
like to study the uh, effects of a, the elasticity of a substrate on cell behavior. And we, we want to contribute to that in, in this way. So imagine I can do the same experiment I just described. We could take neutrophils and put them in a gradient, but we could do it on materials that had different elasticities. So we, let's say we could vary the elasticity from 15 to 12 to 2 to 0.3 uh, kilopascals. Kil 0.3 kilopascals is very weak. It's almost like a fluid. But but what happens in this case is that as the material, the substrate gets weaker, the cells can organize less well, and they don't exit, exert as strong a force, and they can't exert, exhibit direction of motion nearly as well. So here's a demonstration of what the traction stresses look like on these four materials. This is all in the same gradient. So the gradient is the same, but the cells can't organize as well as the material gets stiffer. And the net result of that is that the cells get lost on a soft, softer material, even though they're in a strong gradient. So in, in this case, these are, these are three different elasticities, uh, 0 0.3, 7, and, and 12 kilopascals. And the chemotactic index is consistently going up as we increase the stiffness of the substrate. And you can see just by the little scatter diagrams that on a very soft material, the cells in that gradient, they move at random. They, 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 they can't move directionally. They can't organize their force centers. Whereas if I put the cells in the same gradient on a stiffer material, they can use they can go directly toward, toward a target. So the environment that the cell is in plays a, a critical role in how the cells can organize, organize and translocate. So uh, the last thing I want to say just, just to complete this, this talk, this part of the talk is I know you had Laurel Hind, who is a graduate student from my lab, uh, giving the cell migration seminar a few weeks ago. And she did a wonderful job in my lab at using the same methodology, methodology, bead-based traction microscopy, to measure the forces exerted by macrophages. And this is a result from her, her experiment. She uh, uh, she was able to do traction mapping. And in that case, Macrophages pull by frontal towing. Um, they actually exert a lamellopodial force, grab hold, and then pull the cell forward, very much like a fibroblast would, would display, as been has been articulated by Yuli Wang. So what's what's interesting about this, just to summarize, is that we have all of these cells, they're they're basically all siblings, but they display forces at different magnitudes and in different spatial ways completely differently. <laughs> Um, and it's really remarkable. And uh, if, if I could put it all together in one slide, it's, it's worth having like a summary of all of this out there. Uh, neutrophils, uh, they exert forces between 50 and 100 nanonewtons, depending on whether it's chemokinesis or chemotaxis. This is the reference on the right. Um, murine dendritic cells, uh, they exert forces of about 20 nanonewtons in chemotaxis. Here's a reference from Ricard. And then uh, Laurel's paper on uh, chemokinesis of uh, human primary macrophages. The forces are much, much greater for macrophages. Uh, I should delete this line on T cells. Actually, the, we've never really been able to make uh, reasonable measurements of T cell uh, force migration. Um, uh, and I know there's the data from the Springer lab, and I just defer you to the Springer lab if you want to complete this table and figure out what T cells are doing. So. This is a good place to stop and take questions. So I have my, and I put this here just so I remember to stop because I, 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 I'm terrible at stopping. But the talkometer says I have 62 slides and I'm on slide 27. But I, I, I promise that uh, I, I won't take more than an hour. But there are questions in the chat. So maybe I can look at those and see if I can answer them now before we go on. Or, or you can make, read them to me. I don't, I don't know how you prefer to do this. Yeah, usually we um, help you out by reading them so you don't have to scroll great. through, but That'd maybe, um, Claire, Claire, do you want to actually just um, ask yourself, or if not, I can um, read sure. for you. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wonder, what it seems to me that those forces in the rear, it seems to me that in all your cases, you always had a small rearward force in the sort of front third of the cell. Um, independent of what concentration of chemokine. It was just the rear pinching forces that were changing. And so it seems to me that the, the force that's driving the motility is are those small forces in the front and the pinching, um, first of all, it's gonna cancel out. Um, and uh, um, 
second of all, it seems to me that it's just probably for um, tearing up the rear adhesions and, and providing direction that way. So sort of steering from the rear because you get defects. You didn't really talk about motility speed, um, but you do get defects in directionality as you change those pinching forces. So to me, it's not, it doesn't look like a driving force, but more a, a rear pulling up steering from the rear thing. I, I agree with you in part with what you're saying. So for, first of all, it is, it is a, a pinning and a steering uh, mechanism for sure. Uh, those forces are much greater than what you see in the front. I, I don't think you can get directional migration unless you have some kind of it, uh, adhesion force in the lamellopod uh, in, in order to pull, pull yourself forward a bit. But there's another element in here that I, I think is often underlooked. When you squeeze in the rear, the fluid that's inside the cell has to go somewhere. And that fluid has to move forward in the cell. So the, uh, so the issue is I squeeze in the rear and the fluid has to actually displace toward the lamellopod. And that helps with certain things that you need to happen at the lamellopod, like active polymerization. Um, How does the fluid flowing to the front? Help the polymerization. You think it's just carrying monomers? The, the G-actin, yes, the G-actin that's that's disassembling uh, away from the mellopod membrane is actually carried forward to the front to repolymerize at the at the plus end. Have you have you done any calculations to see if the hundred micromolar actin uh, in these cells, you know, 50, 50 micromolar G actin can't diffuse fast enough to the front in the tiny little cell like that? Oh, I I don't know that it can't. I mean, I just because yeah, there's a shit would, pile of uh, G actin in those cells. Yeah, you know, uh, right. Well, it, it, the the question is, is there enough convection in order to drive it forward? It would probably be an easy calculation. That I haven't done it. I haven't done it. I actually have another way to do this experiment, but uh, which we've been we we've been working on. Uh, we have ways of putting probes inside of uh, neutrophils and watching them move around. So uh, we'll have to talk about that later once we have those experiments done. Thanks. Great, thanks, Claire. Um, we have a, so sort of along the same lines of what you were just talking about. Amanda Stevenson is asking, "What are your thoughts on cytoplasmic streaming, and specifically in neutrophils?" I, I did, yeah, I just articulated it. I think it's, I think okay. it's really important. It's, a, it's a, it's, it's an, I think an underrepresented feature of of how neutrophils move around because this contractile stress at the rear has got the, the fluid in the neutrophil is incompressible. So so the fluid has got to be moving um, from the back to the front. Um, and uh, that will aid just just the sheer motion of the fluid to the front will push the lamellopod, lamellopod forward. So I, I do think it's important. Thank you. Um, we'll take another question before you move forward uh, from Natalie Hewson says, have you tried to change the location of chemoattractant to visualize if the front of the cells become a rare by observing the forces? No, uh, it, in, in the sense of the, the only experiment we've done in this regard is when I move, we move the pipette. So maybe like a 30 angle, 30 degree angle displacement. Uh, the, the, we haven't done anything like the experiments that uh, Daniel Remia has done where you actually flip the gradients uh, in a microfluidic uh, chamber and measured the traction stresses with that H hard experiment, of course, you know, to, to do, but I'd, I'd love, I'd lo love to do something like that. It'd be really, really cool to do, but we haven't done it. Thank you. Uh, maybe we will let you move forward with that. Okay. All right. So, so now the second half of this talk, I want to talk about upstream migration of, um, of, uh, of leukocytes. And to put this in context, so almost all of the all of the white cells they have to move from the circulation into tissue, and they do it through a multi-step cascade, which has been studied quite a bit by Tim Springer and the Butcher Lab and Klaus Lay. And uh, so, basically, in these in, in in this case, the cells in in the fluid and the fluid's moving along along at some rate. The cells get captured, they roll, they migrate on the apical surface of the endothelium, and then they transmigrate. And uh, those of you who, who know the Hammer Lab for a long time know we spent a lot of time doing simulations of capture and rolling, but today I want to talk about migration, this migration stuff. So, and, and let's start this conversation by talking about T cells, because that's, that's the cell in which this uh, phenomena was first identified. So T cells, 
they have two different integrins. Uh, they have an integrin called LFA1, which is a member of the beta-2 family, and its cognate ligand is ICAM1. And they have an integrin called BLA4, uh, and it's in the beta-1 family, and its cognate ligand is BCAM1. And both of those molecules are expressed on the apical surface of, of uh, end, endothelium. But when the cells are migrating around on the apical surface, they're seeing a very strong flow that's pushing them from, from left to right in this particular diagram. Uh, so the question is, how does the flow affect the directionality of motion? So, uh, so before, before I show this, I just want to set this up. So for, first of all, this is an experiment that we did not do. We, this was done by uh, Olivier Theodolis' lab at University of Marseille. It's a wonderful, very clean experiment. And what you're going to see are T cells on a surface uh, in which a molecule called I can, in which ICAM1 is deposited. And at first, the cells are going to be moving in random. And then the flow is turned on, and you're going to watch the cells move up upstream, up against the gradients. And, and this, this uh, demonstration is, is a very convincing demonstration. So uh, so this, this appeared in Biophysical Journal in 2013. Now the cells are moving at random on ICAM1. And then you'll see when the flow is turned on, the cells are going to move upstream uh, against the direction of flow. And every cell does it. And uh, so, you know, we, we, we talk about this as being migration upstream, like a salmon moves upstream. But of course, the molecular mechanisms of this are, are, um, are very interesting. So, so immediately, you know, one can ask questions about this. For, and and this, is, this is what we are trying to work on in the hammer lab. First of all, how does this happen? What, what is going on inside of these cells that allow them to do this? Even if it, it didn't have any physiological uh, uh, implications, it would be fascinating from the point of view of mechanotransduction to understand why a cell that is seeing a very strong flow downward can motor, resist that stress, and then move upward. Uh, and I think we should try to understand that just from a fundamental point of view. The second is, are there any other cell types in the immune system that do this upstream migration? And the third is, are there, is there any physiological relevance? Is there any physiological advantage for a cell to be able to crawl upstream against the direction of flow? So, of course, you know, it's been seen in vivo that, that, that T cells can crawl upstream against the direction of flow. It was actually first uh, uh, published in a paper in Nature, uh, 2008, I think, it was Bartholomew's lab. Uh, they were doing uh, a model of T cell migration and watching them move into the men meninges and did single cell tracking um, and actually should show, could show that cells could move upstream against the direction of flow in, in lots of different uh, circumstances. In that paper, it was kind of an offhand uh, observation. How we, you know, we see cells moving upstream. But that was not the focus of the paper, but it was clearly demonstrated there. And then uh, Chris Hunter, who, who's a collaborator of mine at the University of Pennsylvania, has also seen this. Uh, he's done a lot of work on tracking T cells in the brain in various different zoonotic infections like Toxoplasmosis gondii infections. Um, and here's a video from his lab where the, the general flow of fluid is from the upper right to the left. Um, that's a little hard to see, I think, in this video, but there are clear demonstrations of cells that are moving against the direction of flow. So if you look at this, this uh, T cell that's at two o'clock, it, it's first moving downstream and then turns around and moves upstream. Um, and there are a few uh, demonstrations of this in the video that you can, you can see where the cells are moving against the direction of flow. So cells do it in vivo. Uh, that's, that's what I can say about that. I'll talk more about our plans to test the physiological relevance later, later in the talk. So, so we uh, could, could regenerate this uh, phenomenon in a lab in the chip model. So we, we basically made a, a surface in which we, we, which we printed all the appropriate adhesion molecules that you would see on the endothelium. So these, these surfaces are more complex than uh, the French lab showed. The French lab had just ICAM-1. We have ICAM-1, we have a selectin, we have a chemokine, we block with a, we block with a uh, uh, pleuronic to reduce non-specific binding. And this was done by my graduate student, Nick Anderson. And so he could recreate this entire cascade, including upstream migration in a lab in the chip model. And it's a very instructive video to watch. So uh, this, is, this is our video. Obviously the flow in this case is from, from right to left. And you'll see trajectories of six or seven different cells that are, are rolling in, stopping, and they start to migrate. And at the early stages in this little video, it, it doesn't look very remarkable because, because uh, oh, I, 
be careful not to restart it. We'll, we'll be here forever. So, uh, so uh, if you look at the, for example, if you look at the red cell, um, it, it starts by moving downstream. So, so you can question, what am I talking about? <laughs> what am I, what's this phenomenon I'm describing? But you'll see that as the red cell starts to explore space, it decides it's really moving in the wrong direction and it really wants to move upstream. So it starts to turn like a bus. It takes this big sweeping turn and eventually finds itself moving upstream uh, against the direction of flow. Now, other cells that you can see in this video, like uh, the, the cell in purple or the cell in cyan, they started moving upstream from the moment they stopped. They, they hit the surface, they spread, they were, are moving upstream against the direction of flow. By the time this video is stopped, every single cell in the field of view, and including other cells that I haven't actually traced, are moving upstream against, against the direction of flow. So this is something that the cells really want to do. They're encoded to move upstream uh, against this hydrodynamic force. And, and generally, you would think, well, if nature has evolved to do something, there's got to be a good reason for it. So we, we have to figure out what, what that reason is. So, uh, so the, the first insight to what might be going on uh, might be that if, if we do this experiment, the same experiment I just described on a HUVEC surface, we take a HUVEC monolayer and then activate it so we can up express adhesion molecules and then compare what the cells do with and without LFA1, we can see a clear difference in the ability of the cells to transmigrate. So uh, if, you, if you were to, just to focus on the right panel here, fraction of cells on the apical surface as a function of time after arrest, uh, the green curve shows us what happens on the hubex. So their cells are able to transmigrate very well on the hubex. But if we block LFA1 with an antibody, the cells are not able to migrate upstream and it takes them a lot longer. I mean, significantly longer to get through the uh, endothelial layer underneath. So we think one simple uh, uh, advantage of migrating upstream uh, for these cells is that they can burrow underneath. Whatever the forces are ha happening at the lamellipod that allow them to migrate upstream also allow them to get underneath the endothelium and get out of, out of the blood vessel. So that's one simple explanation that we have. So, uh, so now I want to spend a little time just quantifying this and understanding the various receptor dynamics involved with this. So uh, if we do an experiment on ICAM-1, we see what we see in the upper panel. And, and note that as we go to the right here, the shear rate is increasing. And one of the fascinating aspects of this behavior is that the upstream migration becomes more avid, more robust, as the shear rate goes up, which is exactly the opposite of what you would think. You know, the shear rate is going up. So the cells are being pushed downstream with a bigger and bigger force, but yet the cells are more adamant about moving upstream as the shear rate goes up. If instead I do the experiment on VCAM1, of course I see what I would, I would anticipate seeing. Uh, shear rate is increasing. The flow is from right to left and the cells just kind of tumble downstream. It's, it's hard to really describe this as a true uh, motility. It's, it's a moti mo motility and then they're pushed, motility, they push, they, there's little tumbling elements to this. But of course, on the endothelium, both ligands are present. So what would go on when you mix the two ligands together? So uh, Aaron Dominguez, a graduate student in my lab, did this experiment. So the idea is you make a surface of protein AG and then we mixed chimeras at different ratios between a VCAM1 chimera and an ICAM1 chimera. And they partition roughly according to the FC binding strength on the surfaces. And so we could make surfaces that had different ratios of VCAM1 to ICAM1. And so this left-hand panel shows the ratio of VCAM1 to ICAM1 on the surface. The flow in this case is from left to right. If the surface is entirely VCAM1, the cells move downstream. But if we were to add just a little bit of ICAM-1, 10% ICAM-1 to this mixture, the cells, at least on high shear stresses, will move upstream. They only need a little bit of LFA-1, ICAM-1 interaction in order to move upstream. So on a mixed surface where there's some amount of ICAM-1 present, the cells are gonna migrate upstream. So that's that's the result that we, we had there. Now, uh, so, uh, I, in full disclosure, this is from the from from uh, uh, Professor Diodoli's lab, uh, 
Um, and their hypothesis for how this works is that the cells, when they're migrating on a surface, they have a plastered down lamellopod, but their uropod hangs up into the bulk. And that serves to guide the direction of motion uh, very much like a wind vane could guide the direction of motion of a cell. And depending on the orientation of the wind vane, the cells will want to reorient itself so it's moving in the upstream uh, uh, direction. There's a key experiment I'm going to show you that we've done that is, is consistent with this idea. Um, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll show you that in a moment. Now, the other part of this is the molecular explanation. So there's got to be some molecules that are involved in, in what's going on here. Uh, there's got to be a signal coming in through, through the integrins. And so we think that the, we think that we, I would like to pr pr present a, a self-consistent explanation for all of this, but the, the two elements I think we also have to consider are this. First, LFA1 and ICAM1 interactions are known to form catch bonds. And that, that was uh, measured independently by uh, the Moy lab. So as you pull on this bond harder and harder, it grabs hold tighter and tighter and doesn't want to let go. And so if those interactions are at the lamellopod, um, they're going to hold on to the front of the cell and, and not let go. And they're going to pin the lamellopod forward. And then the second is there's got to be some signal that's generated through the integrin receptor into the cytoskeleton to cause actin polymerization at, at the leading edge. We think both of those things are happening. Now, it could be that by adhering LFA1 at the front, you organize the cell so the, the uropod sticks up and that helps with the wind vane hypothesis. That's also uh, not inconsistent with our explanation. So in collaboration with Jen Burkhart, uh, uh, the, our two postdocs get together as they often as they often did, Nate Roy from the Burkhart lab and Alex Buffon from my lab to try to understand what molecules in the signaling pathway might be responsible for upstream migration. And the first hint to this that we had was uh, Jan has a crack deficient, a crack knockout mouse. So here's what the signaling pathway looks like downstream of LFA1, but before PI3 kinase. There's a key molecule called crack, feeds into C Sybil, C Sybil then activates PI3 kinase, that leads to actin polymerization at the front. So uh, we did a simple experiment. We took uh, T cells from a mouse that was had crack knocked out, and then we did an upstream upstream downstream experiment. And the wild type cells look like this, the direction of flow is left to right. Of course, this is on ICAM-1, direction of flow is left to right, cells move upstream. But on a crack knockout mouse, T cells from a crack knockout mouse, the cells move downstream. So they flip their direction because of the deficiency of crack. And then the second experiment we did was uh, use, using a, a Cas9 expressing mouse uh, that we got from Jan Schwartzberg's lab at NIH. And so in a mouse like this is a great, a very powerful tool because we could screen lots of molecules that are responsible. Um, and uh, the molecule we focused on was C Sybil. So here's a demonstration that we could delete differentially C Sybil or delete PI3 kinase. And then there's this, uh, uh, the, the negative control. We don't delete everything in the cell. And sure enough, if we, uh, the cells are physiologically, they look perfectly normal if we do a C Sybil deletion. Um, and if we then look at the statistics of motion on C Sybil de depleted T cells, we can flip the direction of motion. So both crack and C Sybil seem to play important roles in the directional migration upstream uh, against flow. Interestingly, PI3 kinase does not. Uh, so, uh, you know, of course, we've done the experiment many, many times, but if we do a deletion of PI3 kinase, we do not flip the direction of motion. So, uh, and then the, the percent of cells that are migrating is, is the same. So, um, so, so we think we're on the hunt for molecules that are inside the cell that are responsible for this motion and, and have found a few interesting candidates. That doesn't mean this is an exhaustive list and there may be other molecules yet to be uncovered, but at least we have two interesting candidates. Now, uh, I have a student named Adam Supas who's been trying to build technologies uh, on this. And so I had a simple idea. You know, advisor comes to you with a simple idea, then, you, then it ends up ru ruining your life. That's what, the, the, this is what this, uh, this is like. So Adam, why don't you make some stripe surfaces and, and, and see what happens? So we use microcontact printing to make surfaces 
that were stripes of ligands, and we made different width stripes, 200 micron, 100 micron, 50 micron stripes. And it turns out that the direction the cell will go will depend on the width of the stripe. So this is consistent with this idea that cells need to spread out and explore space and organize themselves in order to move upstream. So, and here's a demonstration, different width stripes. This is a uniform, this isn't a uniform surface. The cells will move upstream as the shear rate increases. This is static 400, 800 inverse seconds cells progressively move upstream. So our services are working well. On, on wide stripes, 200 micron stripes of cells will move upstream, but on narrow stripes, 50 micron stripes will move downstream. So what the cell does depends on the actual physical environment that it's in. And, uh, and you could actually see this if you look at migration in these indices, you could flip the direction of motion depending on the, on the architecture of, of the surface that the cells are, cells are on. And I, I should say, uh, we have corresponding data now from microfluidic channels that uh, agrees perfectly with these results from, from stripe, stripe surfaces. So that paper should be going out uh, soon. Okay, I, I think in the interest of time, I've, I've talked for 15 minutes, I'm gonna skip a few slides. I, 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 hope, I hope you don't mind, um, but let me just skip, just let me just skip forward here um, and uh, get, get to the last bit of this. The question is, what other cell types can do this? And the bottom line is both stem cells and neutrophils can do this. Neutrophils under a very specific set of conditions. So, so these are all cells that have to transmigrate. They're all cells that have to go from the blood vessel into a tissue. So it makes sense that if upstream migration confers an, exam, an advantage that any cell that can do this will, will be able to move upstream at least under some circumstances. It, it makes sense that stem cells will do it. First of all, we use a, we, most of these key experiments we did with a KG1A cell line, which is stem cell-like. It's got the same surface markers as uh, bone marrow uh, stem cells. But what's key is it also has the same adhesion molecule presentation of T cells. So for example, KG1A cells have a lot of alpha L, which is in LFA1. Uh, they have a lot, they have beta one and beta two integrants. Um, and, and, and that's very similar to the way what T cells have. So they have the same receptor distribution. So they, we'd expect them to be, behave the same way. And indeed they do. So if I take K, KG1A cells, I'm sorry that the lines are so thin here, but this, the flow here is left to right. Um, and then what you can see is that many, many of the cells are moving from right to left. This is KG1A cells just on an ICAM-1 surface. And uh, this is what the data looks like. Uh, on ICAM-1 surfaces, I increase the shear rate, they move progressively upstream against the direction of flow. I can block that upstream migration using alpha L. By the way, I wanna point out Alex Buffon, um, my, the postdoc in my lab did all of these experiments and deserves full credit for it. He was the first author of the paper that was in Journal of Cell Science on this. And if you use a neutral uh, antibody against alpha X integrin, then the cells will move upstream. That's, that's, a, uh, that's a control. So uh, pretty convincing that KG1A cells would move upstream. And this was uh, this is corroborated in two ways. First of all, we use human primary stem cells. We also did KG1A cells on HUVEC model layers. Uh, and all of the data is, is consistent. Here is, is KG1A cells on HUVEC model layers. Flow, in this case, is right to left. A lot of these cells are moving uh, uh, left to right. Uh, and the cells look... Un unremarkable, I, except for the fact that uh, maybe uh, if we look at LFA1 staining, uh, the LFA1 staining is everywhere except for the lamellopod. Um, the actin staining is concentrated in, uh, in, I'm sorry, LFA1 staining everywhere except for the uropod. Actin, uh, that seems to be concentrated in the lamellopod as we did with uh, LIFAC uh, labeled cells. The last, uh, last cell type I want to discuss are neutrophils. So uh, neutrophils are all the way down here. By the way, there are other reports of upstream migration for other cell types. For example, it's been shown that B cells, a marginal B cells will migrate upstream as well. Um, but what about granulocytes? So in the original data from the, from the French lab, they, they had this video. And this is neutrophils under eight dynes per centimeter uh, uh, squared shear stress, and the cells are moving downstream. They're moving with the direction of flow. They're creeping in the direction of flow. So it would look like neutrophils can't do this. But our 
our hypothesis was that since everything is uh, built around LFA1, uh, we have to focus on LFA1 interactions in order to get this to work. And of course, neutrophils have a competing integrin for ICAM1, it's MAC1. So our simple hypothesis was we could get neutrophils to crawl upstream if we block MAC1. And that turns out to be true. And we've demonstrated this a number of ways. Antibody blocking, CRISPR deletion, uh, all of the data is consistent. I'll show you most of the antibody stuff. So these are, uh, and, uh, and also we used HL60 cells to screen a lot, of, a, lot of these, a lot of the physics. So first on the left panel, if we have HL60 cells on an isotype antibody, an ICAM1, they will, they will migrate in the direction of flow. You can, you can see that they're migrating. They, look at this green one here. It'll migrate with the direction of flow. Flow is left to right here. But if we use, uh, if we use a, an anti-MAC1 antibody, then we can flip the direction of flow and the cells will move from right to left. So blocking MAC1 enables the cells to migrate upstream. And that's seen with the migration indices where you get a flip in the direction uh, as, you use, as you use an anti-MAC1 uh, uh, integrant. Um, also, we can do primary neutrophils, we get the same result. Um, and so that leads me to uh, talking about one or two things that we want to do in the future. So I, I opened this talk by talking about neutrophil traction microscopy. And I said that T cell traction microscopy in our hands, we can't do, the forces are too small, but we can certainly measure the traction stresses of a neutrophil. Uh, it is hard for me to imagine that a neutrophil that's migrating upstream would exert its traction stresses at the rear. So I anticipate that, we, that when we do either MAC1 deletion or MAC1 blocking, we're gonna flip the organization of where the traction stresses are but we would very much like to do traction stresses of an upstream migrating a neutrophil. And uh, the last thing I wanna say is that we have plans for doing in vivo tests of the effects of, uh, the effects of uh, deleting upstream migration. So basically the way these experiments would work are you take a population of T cells, use CRISPR to delete C Sybil or crack, uh, differentially label those cells with a different dye compared to wild type and do a, a classic uh, infection in an organism. What comes to mind is something like a toxoplasmosis Gandhi infection, where you can actually watch T cells hunt down parasites and look at the differential advantage that cells have because of the ability to migrate upstream. And that's an experiment that we have planned with, with Chris Hunter's lab. So uh, you've made it to the end of the of the taco meter so uh so to summarize this talk t cells and, and stem cells they migrate upstream and i can one downstream and vcam one uh i didn't talk this is the part of the talk i deleted that the t cells display memory uh neutrophils migrate upstream upstream on i one if mac one is blocked crack and c sybil are key molecular players for upstream migration and our future work is to do in vivo tests for defects in upstream migration and TFM on cells that are migrating upstream, neutrophils in particular. These are the members of the Hammer Lab I highlighted in today's talk, uh, my collaborators uh, that I mentioned as we went along. Funding has come from NIGMS, and this is a, a picture of my pandemic surviving Hammer Lab, which I'm very, very proud of. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, I think we have first question from Hani Suleiman asking, have you looked at ICAM and VCAM receptors on the T cells segregate in the front and the rear? Uh, we, we have not. Uh, I, I'm embarrassed to say that because it's such an obvious uh, me measurement to do, but we have not. It, it requires fixing and staining and, uh, and, and uh, we, we, I, I, I'm embarrassed we haven't done that. We should, we should do that, but we haven't. Oh, Emily has a question. Please go ahead, Emily. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I think this is kind of maybe a follow-up to that question, but beautiful work, first of all. I really love this story, and I think it's really interesting. Um, you know, thinking along those lines, if you think that this 
this crawling upstream may be helping to sell, sell to diapedes instead of generating more force and more traction for them to be able to do so. Are there differences in actin density in the lamellipodia of these cells um, or in actin nucleating factors or, or turnover factors? Uh, so uh, when, when we did the confocal uh, uh, staining of LIFAC labeled uh, 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 new, uh, KG1A cells, we did see quite a bit of accumulation of actin in the lamellipod. So we do we do see that. Uh, our only work with various different nucleating factors had, was on the part of the talk I suppressed, which is on memory. Um, and so let me just say that if in T cells, if I if I put them on surfaces that have they on some some cases they'll display memory of the direction of flow even if the flow is turned off they'll they'll move they'll continue moving in that direction and what's key to that memory is that they're on an icam one surface so they can move, move upstream but the but the elef, uh, the uh vla4 has to be engaged by uh by vcam1 so there's a crosstalk of the integrins that uh, that propagates this signal uh and it turns out that various different nucleators like wasp and arp23 they have they play no role in this memory whatsoever so um but uh, so that's our, our one extent of having looked at, uh, at the motion. So, so they don't affect upstream migration either. Okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Emily. And linking to Emily's question, I had a question. So when you say these, uh, that RP3 and BASP might not be, you know, responsible for this directionality, why do you think then Lemelipodia is really the one making that decision? Maybe I got confused somewhere down the line because if that switch doesn't happen in the direction, when you knock, you know, knock down up to three or wasp. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so I want to make sure I understand the question. So, uh, uh, in the upstream migration part of this, uh, how do I think lam the lamellar plays a role, or? Yeah, so for example, you showed us that, uh, you know, PI3K signaling doesn't have an effect, it doesn't change the direction, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Is it the same result for uh, up to three inhibition? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, it's the same result for up to three in inhibition. So uh, as, as far as I remember, I think Sarah did those experiments uh, where she used it, in, she, we used we didn't use CRISPR to do that. We did, had a pharmacological inhibitor of ARP23, and they did not affect upstream migration. So it, it's weird that certain molecules you think would be really important, like PI3 kinase, ARP23, WAS, they don't seem to play a role in in driving upstream motion. Uh, so that's a bit of a mystery, and we don't quite understand that. Interesting. Thank you so much. Thanks. We have a question from Benjamin Lin asking if there's a hierarchy between upstream migration and chemotaxis. Uh, good question. So I, uh, we have not tested that and it would be really fun to build a chamber where you put cells in, in a fluid in one direction and then a chemokine gradient in another direction and made the cell choose. Uh, we, it, if we could figure out how to design a chamber to do that, it would, that would be a really fun experiment to do, but we haven't done that. I mean, it would probably be most powerful if you made, if you had the flow in one direction and then the gradients in the other direction, in the, you know, in the, in the direction, the, in the, in this, in the counter direction, uh, you know, on the same axis as, as the flow. You could do it, you're probably easier to do it perpendicularly. You could probably do it in the Christmas tree chamber because in the Christmas tree chamber, as you know, you're making a molecular gradient that's that's perpendicular, but there's a flow that's acting uh, because the mixing is all occurring because there's a flow down the Christmas tree channel. So you could do it orthogonally, uh, but I don't think you'd learn as much as if you did them uh, in opposition. That would be a fun experiment to do. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, when I was really struck by the experiments where your micro patterns manage to switch the direction of, of migration. And sorry if I missed this, but um, is there any morphological 
difference in or sort of mechanistic difference in how the cells are, are you know, are they switching their migration mode because now they're in confinement mode as opposed to, um, you know, upstream migration mode? Like, uh, you know, I'm just, if you look closely, are there any clues to how, um, just at, based on, you know, cell shape and stuff, are there any clues to how that's that's happening? So what we, uh, the, the short answer to that is no. And, for, and first is that the channels are still of a width that we, d we don't regard the cells to be under confinement per se, because they're at 25 microns, we haven't are tr aren't trying to squeeze the cells at this point. But what we so have- So no physical we, squeezing, but just ECM guidance right. then. Exactly, okay. exactly. So, so uh, you know, the one concern we've had about these experiments is that, did we build a topology of the surface when we stamp molecules on a substrate? Because like, let's say we made, we were stamping molecules on a surface and we made a plateau. And the cells can't get off the plateau. They can't, uh, uh, does something about being on a plateau force them to interact with the edge in a weird way? But I, but I, I, I want to say without showing the data that we've also done microfluidic channels, which are wells um, that are the same width, we get the same result. So I don't think it has to do with it being a plateau or a well. Uh, what we have done is we have scored many, many hundreds of cells for their behavior their trajectory and try to figure out, is there some subset of cells that interact with the, with the wall of the edge in some weird way? And they skew the distribution. Uh, so the cells invariably on a narrow channel will, will find their way to the wall and then they'll migrate along, they'll migrate right along the wall. Um, but they, they migrate along the wall in, in the downstream direction. But, but if you, even if you subtract out all the cells that interact with the wall and only score the cells that never get anywhere near the wall, they, the cells will still oper operate largely in a downstream direction if the channel width is 25 microns. So that's not, doesn't seem to be the explanation for why the cells do that. Yeah, that's so interesting. I almost, I can envision doing like an angled channel so they, the cells will migrate upstream and then get to the point and then they'll turn around, but then, <laughs> you know. I, 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 I've proposed all of these experiments and I, I, you know, and I, and I, you know, or, you know, we you know, experiments where you make a bunch of different channel widths in the same device or experiments where you make grids um, where the cells, they're like they're walking around New York City, these cells, and then they can move down the avenues and up, up the streets. And then, you know, where do they go, depending on the width of the grid? I, you can imagine hundreds of experiments uh, like this. Uh, yeah, if sorry. anybody out there wants to fund this, send me some money. <laughs> <laughs> Contact me and I'll write mm -hmm. a proposal or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to keep an eye out for, for that. Um, the paper that you said is, is coming out soon on that. I'm really excited to read it. We haven't, we um, haven't submitted, it. We're submitted soon. Yeah. 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 Soon enough. I think we have a question from Amanda Stephenson asking, how are you measuring the force in the PDMS pillar surface that you showed with neutrophils? Okay. Uh, so, so I showed two attraction measurements. One was with, um, one was with uh, pillars, and that was with dendritic cells. In that case, what we've done is we've labeled the tips of the, of the posts with a fluorescent dye. And then we look at the mm -hmm. deflection of the post. Um, so, and then we know what the spring constant of the post is. So we just multiply the spring constant of the post times the, uh, the deflection to measure the force. When the neutrophil experiments, the way we did those is we had a gel and we embedded beads within the gel. And then we put the cells on top and we watched the cells migrate around. And then we looked at the displacement of the beads that are embedded within the gel. And we use an elasticity calculation. The, the person who did this algorithm was, was Micah, where you back calculate the forces that most likely were present on the neutrophil surface to give rise to the displacement field that you saw. It's like an optimization uh, calculation. And, and so it's, it's like a curve fit of what the most likely distribution of forces are um, on the substrate. So those two experiments were done different ways. Awesome. Um, if I could ask one more, maybe that's the last question and then we'll wrap it up. I was wondering in the crack, no crack, sorry, crack uh, knockout. Um, is it just the front of the cell that's affected or is it also the back? Because I was thinking about the model which you were talking about back steering the direction. 
Yeah. We don't see any obvious physiological deficiencies of, uh, of the cell from the crack knockout mouse. If, if we had seen like big morphological changes or something, we would be worried. But there's no loss of uropod or something. No, no there's, okay. no, there's no loss. Yeah. Interesting. I think we can wrap it up if there are no questions. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and giving a wonderful talk today. Thank, thank you.